Nestled in a secluded valley on the Wiltshire-Somerset border in southwest England, Eyford Manor boasts one of Britain's most beautiful historic gardens. During my visit, I'll be in deep water with the head gardener, Troy. Is there a snake in here? Yeah. What? What? Getting artistic in the kitchen with head chef, Jack. There Look at that. And enjoying the glorious British summer weather with William. When I married into the British aristocracy, it was the start of a wonderfully exciting journey, but it was also a little daunting. I became a Viscountess, and for an American girl from a small town outside Chicago, that was quite a shock. I live with my husband, Luke, heir to the Earl of Sandwich, and our family at Mapperton House in Dorset. Living in a place like this is a joy, but also a challenge. And every day we're aware that we're preserving a very special part of Britain's heritage. Mapperton has opened up an extraordinary new world for me, and I can't wait to share it with you all. So if you love castles and manors, and stately homes as much as I do, please join this American Viscountess as I journey into the British countryside in search of some of Britain's finest historic houses. I'm here at Eiford Manor today and I'm visiting our great friends, William and Marianne. I've been to the house before, but I've never properly explored the gardens. So that is what I'm about to do. Hello. Hello. How, How are, are you? you? Good. Good so to see nice you. to see you. Yeah. Now, am I just about to walk under the Eiford Wisteria? Well, it's certainly one of them, but it's the <laughs> earliest. This is um, about 1820s. Wisteria only came to the UK in 1815. So this is definitely one of those very early plants and it has an amazing scent and it produces amazing flowers and it's very happy on the south face I of mean, the Bath Stone. So I'm just trying to do my maths here. So basically, this is 200 years old. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the American in me, I need to date everything. <laughs> <laughs> I need to find out if it's older than my country or not. I mean, but 200 years old, incredible. It's an awesome plant. All anyway. Right. I'm gonna remember this moment. Let's go get your coffee. Okay, great. <laughs> Well, you've picked a really lovely day for me to come. Thank you. It's um, lovely to <laughs> see you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing me here when the sun is shining. So tell me a little bit more about why your gardens are so special. Well, they've got a very rich history. I, they go back to medieval times when this was a rich factory owner's house with uh, a factory at the other end. It was two buildings. And then it was really the Georgians who did the terraforming. So all the terraces you see behind us yes, yes. Uh, and up into the hills, those are Georgian terraces. We're talking between 1730, I suppose, and 1820, that sort of period. And the Georgians were the great builders, weren't they? they? They didn't think twice about just cutting in and building something new. And then it's Harold Pito who comes in 1899 down the hill over there on his bicycle. And he's looking for somewhere to settle down, looking for the perfect house. And here he finds this jewel of a little sort of smart Georgian villa at the bottom of a steeply wooded hill facing south and with a little stream, a river in front. And I think when you look out that way, you kind of sense maybe he felt he was on the north shore of Lake Como absolutely. or maybe Lake Garda right. or somewhere like that. Yes, yes, you know, absolutely. He was in the sort of Villa Bellagio looking out <laughs> over his beautiful glistening lakeside, but crucially setting it in England, his beloved England, because he was an Edwardian Englishman. So he's really the creator of, this, of these gardens. He's yes. the augmenter. Right, he's he the augmenter. He takes a Georgian garden and plays with it and turns it into something else. He's not a capability brown sweeping everything away to create something new. He is somebody who augments, who builds another layer of history for another one to come on top of him. That's us. 
and another one on top of us. And it's that extraordinary rich sort of sandwich, I suppose you would say. Well, I um, like that uh, word. Well, of course. You do. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that extraordinary sandwich, the filling is getting bigger. And I suppose the failure is when you're the one who puts the top on the sandwich. Yeah. Because you can, you're not continuing. You're, you're not strip. continuing. You're wrapping it, it up. Yep, exactly. Well, my husband wanted me to mention to you that we do have a connection. And I don't know if you're aware of this. I'm not. But my father in law, Sandwich, yes. speaking of Sandwich, so the 11th Earl of Sandwich, my father in law's mother was Rosemary Pito. How extraordinary. Yeah. So her great uncle was Harold. I've always wondered whether Harold Pito had an influence or vice versa or knew Mapperton. Exactly. I've always wondered that. Because Mapperton's Italianate Gardens were created by Ethel Labashare and they were created over seven years from 1920 mm. to 1927. Mm. So Harold Pito was still around, right? He was definitely around. He died in 1933. He would have been, I would think, by that stage in his career, advising. Yes. Uh, rather than doing. He was in his 60s and early 70s. But I bet he went I to visit. I bet he went there. These gardens are 20 years prior. So this is 1900 to 1910. Yep. The cloister, which we'll see later, is 1914. Right. Um, pretending to be 12, 15. Because nothing you see in this garden is quite as it seems. Don't trust anything. Don't That's trust anything. Okay, piece of okay. For this garden. The gardens at Eiford may largely be the brainchild of one man, but it's William's parents, Elizabeth and John Cartwright Hignett, who have lovingly kept Harold Pito's vision alive for the past 50 years. My mother came to Eiford in 1965. She bought Eiford um, from a nephew of Harold Pito, and she basically spent 50 years restoring Eiford. I mean, she picked it up as a 25-year-old single woman. What? Which is kind of... Um, in the 60s is kind of crazy. So your mother bought Eiford, age 25, yep. and took over the running of it. That's right. I mean, she was moving her family from an enormous uh, house called Aino Park. Beautiful. Yeah, Sir yeah, John yeah, Stone of course. House. Moved down here. A um, bit of a downsizing, if you can call it that. Um, <laughs> still, um, downsizing nevertheless. And so she moved in. She married my father in 1979. I think it was probably one of the best things that happened to Eiford in the last 50 years, because he then poured his energies into this garden for 40 years and restored the buildings and the structures so that now we're in a position to take it on for the next 50 years. Exactly. So uh, you grew up here. Condition. You yeah, grew up here watching your parents run this. Exactly right. Because this is, you know, not only is this a, a lot to take on, of course, but the gardens. Mm. So the gardens are what people come and see. And I actually yes. haven't seen them yet. So what I want to do right now is go and explore these. Let's go Maybe get around. my hands a little bit dirty too. Absolutely. Great. <laughs> Harold Pito called these gardens paradise, and I can see why. I'm having a little wander, and there's just so much to see. I mean, it, this garden is, is, you know, terraced on so many different levels, and when you go from one level to the next, it completely changes. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. The gardens are planted over two and a half acres and are tended by a team of gardeners and volunteers who keep them in full bloom. It is incredible. It's just magical. And there's so many places dotted around the gardens that you can just find a spot, sort of contemplate, because it's so peaceful, it's serene, the smells are incredible. And again, it's just an opportunity to find a spot, sit down and just be. I'm heading up to see Troy, the head gardener. Troy is obviously an expert here at Iford. 
I kind of don't know where I'm going, but I'm gonna head up the path right here. Hi. Hello. Oh my goodness. I found you. <laughs> yes. I'm now in the Japanese garden, is that right? Japanese or Oriental garden. Or Oriental. There's so many different layers of this garden. I mean, and I don't just mean by the way that it's built up. It's, there are so many different sort of compartments, there I is, guess, if you is. like. What I find fascinating here is you literally walk six yards behind you and you've traveled like 6,000 miles to Europe. That's, yeah. that's like the Roman Appian Way, and here we are in, in Japan. Right, that's where I just was. So why is it that there are so many, what was it with Harold Pito? Mm. He, he purposely did this to create these sort of different elements throughout. Yeah. It was a genius, I think, you know, because there's these moments, but he doesn't try to separate them. They're very much linked, but it feels still effortless. You know, it doesn't feel awkward moving from one space to the other. No. I don't know how he manages to achieve that because it's one of the most difficult aspects of garden design, if you like, the transitions. But I mean, he went to all these places, so he traveled to Japan, I think in about 1895, very early on, really. He spent uh, a few weeks there and brought back, obviously, the ideas and some of the things that he saw there. Right, so this is kind of like a little grand tour. Mm, Do you know what absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> That's what it kind of feels like when I walk around. So, Troy, tell me, how long have you been here as head gardener? So I was, uh, I've been here just about two years as head okay. gardener, but I mean, I knew, I've known Eiford for a long time. It's, um, the way it nestles in the landscape so beautifully was the first thing that struck me. I used to walk along the river um, about 25 years ago. Um, oh my goodness. So it's lovely to be here so now in the garden. In the garden. Okay, so I, you probably get asked this all the time, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, what is your, do you have a favorite part of the garden? I think it is probably here. Oh, I think oh good. I think it, <laughs> there's something different about this, this, this space. You know, it's not about the obvious. Right. It's about the orchestration of the greens, the dappled light, the sound of the water there, the coolness, the temperature changes dramatically, you know, just stepping into this, this space. So yeah, I think here is it's, one of it's my favorite here. places. It's got, it's got all those elements. So what can I do to help you? Well, to, yeah, well, today I'm, well, I'm, cutting these, let me. I'm cutting these irises down today. These are uh, right. a lovely Japanese water iris, but I think I'm okay continuing with that. Okay. What would be really useful, if you don't mind getting into the, pot, in, into the water. I love water. <laughs> okay. I love doing, well. I mean, like how far do you want me to go? Well, it would be really nice to, to I've got a net. Uh, we can skim off all of this kind of floating, oh. floating leaves, which okay. would be lovely. Fantastic. Well, I, okay, well. Did you lay these out for me? I did. Oh, excellent. I oh thought my you, gosh. Might, uh, you I might. I have to have waiters on. <laughs> I'm so excited. So I'm going to put these on. Now, I'll grab the net. Great. Okay, fantastic. Super. So I'm just going to put these on. There we go. How do I look? <laughs> All right, Troy, I'm ready. So I suppose you... wobble those ones. Okay, but I'm going, I am <laughs> going, going in. in. I'm going in. in. I'm stepping into the unknown. Okay, that's a bit, mm -hmm. okay. I'm stepping in, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, there we go, me and water. We're, we do like each other, yeah, it's. Mm -hmm. Watch the, um, the deep bit. Where's the deep bit? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so I'm just, all this. Yes, please. Okay, okay, all this, okay, super. Just like a surface skim. Surface, surface, so a little bit higher up. Yeah, and probably the net a bit more horizontal. So okay. that's it. Yeah, like, and just kind of drop in and then. So, it's, so it's not over the edge. I think that was my issue. Okay, that's not a very good job. Do you Perfect. want me? To, really? Okay. okay yeah. So now and where then do I put just it? Sort of swivel round and flick it onto the edge. I'm, d I'm just curious. These they don't have any holes in them, do they? <laughs> it's feeling a bit. It's feeling, it's feeling a bit cold. Okay, so slap, so it's like a pancake, right? Yeah. Okay. On here. Yeah, thank you. One, two, three. Okay. And you just carry on? And then I can just, I don't yeah, have to flip it back around. Fine, no. Okay, so I'm gonna go under here. Okay, great. Okay, so am I, how fast do you normally do this? Well, we like to do it every week and yeah. probably about two hours. So it's, it's quite a commitment, but I think that surface, the clarity of the water, yeah. It's quite important, and because you we're in there, we are stirring it up, but that all settles. That, that all settles, this, the stirrup. Okay, yeah, wow, wow. 
Okay, so I'm gonna be here, Troy, for like two hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we've got the weeds, uh, the leaves here, but also some of that blanket weed as well, which Okay, which so I am trying to get the leaves in, yes? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, I see a dragonfly there. Oh, so much wildlife, it's great in here. This year we've seen so many things. There's frogs, toads, newts, snakes. Wait, I, I'm sorry, say that again? <laughs> With, are there, no, no, I'm fine with frogs, I'm fine with toads, fine with newts, I swim with them. Snakes, I have an issue. Are there snakes in here? We've seen snakes swimming in here. <gasps> okay. They're, okay. They're safe ones, they're only grass snakes. They're just grass, I didn't know grass I snakes think. could swim. You think, Troy, <laughs> you're, you're putting me into snakes. I, have a, I, ha I do have a fear of snakes and cows, but they're, they're not like gonna attack me. Right? You just might scoop one up in your net. What? What? Shut up. Is there a snake in here? Oh my gosh. I, I think... Steven, did you really see a snake? You did. Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm really bad at this. <laughs> Sorry, Troy. I'm visiting Eiford Manor, known for its beautiful historic gardens. I'm meeting head gardener Troy Scott Smith and lending a helping hand in the Japanese garden. Troy. Hello again. So what are you planting here? These She's are wonderful little plant, look at that. It's called Roscoa, it's a Japanese plant. Oh. Roscoa auriculata. Lovely open purple trumpets. So we're just gonna just put these around here. So. Fantastic, and um, do you do these every year? They're Is perennial, no, they'll they're last, oh. last over time. Oh, yeah. they'll last, oh wow. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so yeah, just a case of digging that hole where, yeah. where you are. That okay. Would be, that'd be great. My mother-in-law has this brilliant line that she says, people come to visit a house once, oh, yes. but they come to visit yeah. the gardens yes. four times a year through the yeah. seasons. Yeah. And do you feel that as well here? Yeah. I mean, Iford's, I think, is a bit special because it doesn't necessarily rely on the horticulture. Right. So, you know, it's the setting. So in winter is beautiful. I, mean, I really like the, um, the play of light in winter on the structure, on the soft bath stone we have here. Um, and then in spring and summer, of course, you know, you get all the, all the loveliness from the, from the blossom. So, yeah. I mean, you love winter and then as spring arrives, you, you love spring and then yeah, summer and you, true. you love summer. This is the draw. People come to Eiford for the gardens and you as head gardener, why do you think that is? It has got something unique I think I, but I think it is that sense of arrival when you arrive it's unexpected you come down these steep-sided valleys it's nestled in the in the valley floor the river fast-flowing river running just by its doorstep and I think all that adds to that somehow the drama and then you come into the garden and this very unexpected sense of the Tuscan hillside the Italian garden the oriental garden all nestled in this vernacular and yeah. it is something about that which is, which I think is, is the special sense of Eiffel. Later, I'll be heading over to the kitchen to help prepare afternoon tea. But first, I need to pick some rather special flowers, which apparently are tasty too. Well, we've got, you know, lots of flowers here, particularly this part of Eiford. But what we've got over here is actually some pots, which um, are probably perfect for you. They've okay, fantastic. And all sorts of things in, so let me show you those. Yeah, because I want to make sure, obviously, I think we're going to top them onto some cakes. Mm. Well, so, these would be fun, wouldn't they? Yeah, beautiful, and the colors. These are a little violet called triple. These are little violet. Okay, so here's the thing. When I just need to pick it from the top, is that right? Well, I think probably for for, for yeah. eating you would, but for the garden, if you can pinch it right down. Yeah, okay, that's what I was going to yeah. ask you. So And then you can just take the top. <laughs> I don't suppose you want to eat the stove, but yeah, so, and actually, these you can eat as well. What? These, these daylilies, they, they can, you can eat them. You're kidding whether me. You'd, whether you'd be brave enough, but you can eat them, seriously. So Have you eaten them before? No. Okay. But, but you can. <laughs> I'm not, I, I wouldn't joke about such okay. a serious thing, really, so... Yeah, these or the buds would be lovely. You can eat the mm. buds. Shall we try now? I think we should try one right <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. now. <laughs> Shall we? It seems a shame yeah, to, this take, is it. to take the flower. There we go. Okay, okay. It is a shame to take the flower. Okay, 
Should yeah. we just go for it? All right, on the count of three. Yeah, go on. One, two, three. three. Actually, okay. Actually, <laughs> not, really nice. Actually, not bad. <laughs> It tastes like something. I really didn't know what to expect. <laughs> These are really nice. Mm. There's, I'll do I that again. Yeah. That was fantastic. Oh my goodness. So you can help yourself to all of those. I can, I, yeah, I'm going to basically, you're going to come back tomorrow and all of these <laughs> yeah, are going to yeah, be gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll leave you to it then. Okay, great. Thanks, Troy, That's so okay. much. See you again. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, that was delicious. I might have to have another one. Yeah, he's gone. Okay, I'll pick like this really small one here so it goes unnoticed. It's actually really delicious. I have to get that. If there's a flavor that's coming through and I can't quite get it, it'll come to me later. Right now, I've got to pick. So see, that's why I asked that question to Troy. Like, so I, I knew that obviously edible flowers, it's just the flower. But see, from a gardener's point of view, he was like, no, you've got to pick it from, you know, the stem all the way down so, so that you don't ruin the plant. Right, I think this will be enough for the kitchen. Also, just remember that you need to be with somebody who knows about what flowering plants are edible. So. I trusted Troy, he's a head gardener, he's an expert, and he knows what's edible. Definitely don't just pick up a flower and eat it. Know for sure if it's edible. After a glorious morning in the garden, this happened. Traditional British summer weather made a dramatic appearance. And so it rained. And rained. Okay, okay, are we, no. are we gonna go, no, are you, really? Oh, come on. You're gonna give come me a tour of the garden in this? Yeah, what? It's your, okay. no, no. Oh my god. Okay, so that was a good garden tour, so I'm glad you enjoyed that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Armed with William's meteorological optimism, as well as umbrellas, we set off. Okay, right, now in the context of English weather, this is not raining. Okay, but okay? This is, it is raining. It is William. not raining. William, it's raining. Imagine, it is not raining. <laughs> Imagine the azure sky that Mr. Pito saw when he arrived at Iford. It is. It is not raining. Yeah. Come on, you've got a brolly. Wait, so go. I, I'm not going to, you don't want me to put this up? I'm not wearing it. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wellington boots, all you need. And you dry, oh, here's Busy. Look, she hasn't, has she got an umbrella? No. She has no, no umbrella. she doesn't. Lovely Georgian terraces, upgraded by Harold Peter. So they were but, Georgian because they needed a garden for recreation. Right. Invite the rector around, get your friends around, you know, the rest of it. And they wanted to show off the valley. And they wanted to show, but ah, then because they're all about showing off. But the you're right, absolutely. So then here is this lovely conservatory terrace where they are integrating the conservatory of the house yes. with the garden. Very much yes. a, a grand tour idea. Look at Busy right here. Yeah, she's... So she is happily... Well, it's her garden, just, right? Yeah, it's I mean, her garden, right? So these, these, all these little terraces constricting our space, giving us a shooting glance, and then up to the main garden above through this set of steps and then at the top you come through this arch yes. and you see this a cathedral of space above this amazing plane tree I mean look up there isn't that spectacular yeah that 1779 that was planted to commemorate uh, the our the, independence nearly the birth your... of Thomas Gaisford <laughs> uh, but nevertheless um, it's close 1776 perfectly reasonable guess uh, 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 Thomas Gaysford ended up as a Dean of Christ Church, Oxford. He lived here. He was uh, a great Greek scholar, the Regis Professor at 31, bright cookie. Oh. Um, and he lived here, he wrote his sermons on the Great Terrace. He, he was a great one for the Grand Tour. So he brought cypresses in here, even as early as the Georgian period, this was known for its cypress walks. And then as we round this wonderful corner, we sort of, you know, you can't really see where you're going. And then you arrive at this representation of effectively a Tuscan hillside.
So here, if you look up, you've yeah. got this wonderful tree form of juniper, the cypresses, you've got rosemaries, old rosemaries with their woody stems, it really yes. redolent of trips to the Mediterranean. And the thing about this garden is that it is essentially a series of memories, but they're not Mr. Pito's memories, although they were. They're actually your memories, they're my memories. They're things which trigger a memory in us. And we go, oh, that's a bit like when I went to insert holiday that you had when you were nine or whatever. And that's right. the point of these fragments of masonry. And then if you look at this end, to this little patio, which is, I think, redolent of those Cordoban and civilian patios. You know, when you see down a corridor, there's a pool of light at the end. Yes. There's sort of the coolness of that central patio in a house um, in, amid the chaos of the city. And this is that cool, safe, quiet space. Yes, it is. Planted up with lush foliage, scented plants. Can you smell that? I absolutely, well, what am I smelling here? Am I smelling well, you're Tuscany? Smelling, you're, you're smelling, I suppose, the south of Spain, Tuscany, sages, you've got um, uh, geraniums, you've got all of those lovely scented plants, and crucially, the sound of water, yeah. which leads you on. You hear it before you see it. It draws you through a garden, and that's the genius of Pito, to place water in places that makes you want to find out where it came from. Where it came from. I love his little fern too. Wonderful, cool? the fern is fantastic. <laughs> it's like a too. hairstyle. Yeah, it is, it is. A little bit Medusa. Yeah, a little bit, maybe. Yeah, maybe. It's that. better when it's earlier, it's just coming yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> so essentially, Pito is creating a garden, an international garden, but he's not doing it in the sense that here's the French bit, here's the Italian Renaissance bit, here's the Roman bit. Here he's intermingling everything. If you drew a Venn diagram of all of right. the world's cultures, all of the kind of the bits that they all thought were beautiful, this is the intersection <gasps> of that beauty. How wonderful. And then you come into this little pool with a little garden, perhaps Pompeian, the sort of thing you see at the back of a house in Pompeii. Absolutely, yes. A little bit of Is water, it... <gasps> kick Always. the kids out, go and play Ludo or whatever they played, abacus at the back of their house <laughs> in Pompeii. And so this is, and now I'm just seeing, I mean, we've only been through just a fraction of the garden, but there is water everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. It's a crucial element of the garden because it, it really creates life in a garden yes. space, doesn't it? That sound of water is constant. It's always there. It's ever moving. It creates a sense of energy. And as we look up, there's this little quirk here, which I rather like. Pito hated asymmetry. He took the false wing off the manor because he didn't, you know, because yeah, the Georgians yeah. had, of course, had to have a, a symmetrical house and Pito hated symmetry. So he takes the wing off. But here he has 15 of these beautiful terracotta tiles and he places them five, six, and four. I don't know a single designer who would ever do that. <laughs> it shouldn't work, and yet it does. Yeah. And what it does is it creates an ability for him to create an asymmetrical space beneath. You wouldn't know it, but the walls aren't square, nothing lines up, because nothing ever lines up at Eiford. It's all a bit of a fudge. That's right. the key. And this is his magnificent terrace. This is incredible. This is the wow moment right here. It kind here. of is. This is wow. It is. This is what I think he wanted you to just oh stop and take goodness. it in. This is just magical. So this is a representation of the Appian Way coming out of Pompeii on its way out, you know, with the cart tracks and all of that, passing monuments and sarcophaguses and orchi. And I mean, I'm actually that. forgetting that I'm in England right, right now. I honestly That's right. am. That's literally what I was thinking. Okay. So then you've so, got lovely English roses up the columns, which yeah. gives the sort of whimsy. You've got Romulus and Remus, which is the last uh, copy taken from the oh. Capitoline. So that's very much the, the influence of Rome right at the heart of the garden. But then look out through oh. the colonnades and you get this incredible setting of the landscape. And it is the borrowed landscape, shake. He learned this in Japan when he was right. there in 18. Shake, what does that mean? Shake is the borrowed landscape. It is setting your garden in the context of its surroundings. So it's the opposite of what Roman theory does, which is build a forum and the safe space and everyone looks in. Yes. The Japanese are building something to look out. To look Much out. more of an outward looking gardening style. And as a result, you're constantly with this balance of the, the, the foreground and the space that you're in. It's like a basilica, isn't it? With a yeah, no, no, absolutely it is. And then the outward view, and there's another out to the countryside. Fantastic. So everything is always in balance. And the internationalism is the other key here, which is that he wasn't going out in a sort of 18th century British Empire way and saying, you know, we really ought to be more British. We should be more British. You'll appreciate it. You'll love it. Um, he wasn't doing that. He was going out to see what everyone else could teach him. 
This was, an, this was a magpie for ideas. He wanted to learn. He went to Japan for 10 weeks to learn ikebana, to learn you know, flower arranging, right. to learn about the placement of objects, to learn about shake. All of these amazing concepts were completely alien to, to the To learn West. and then bring them back and here. And then to use for his clients. Right, incredible. The love and respect which William and his family have for Harold Pito's vision here is so inspiring and clear to see as we arrive at the Japanese garden where thankfully the water has settled after my waiting efforts. Originally, Pito wanted the Japanese garden here. So this is not Pito? Uh, not fully, no. I mean, originally he had, so he'd built his, his shelter. Right. Do step up onto here, it's a lovely view. Okay. He built his shelter, he'd bought his pagoda and his lanterns. Yeah. And he had found with his workmen the rather wonderful rock at the far <gasps> side, which is, yes. of course, representative of... Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji. Fantastic. There you are. So it's that representation oh. of the really important things that the, you know, the Japanese hold dear to them. Mount Fuji is revered. Yeah, of course. And, and so he created that. And then, sadly, 1933 arrived, and that was the end of Mr. Pito's tenure on Earth. So he moved on. And in 84... My 1984. father, 1984, <laughs> uh, yes, okay, quite often the wrong century appears, I appreciate that. In 1984, my father decided to finish the job, as he puts it. So this is truly a John Hignett garden, and I'm really proud of what he's achieved here. We're still working on it. Oh it's goodness. 40 years in, and there are it's, views being created. There are, it's one of the it's things wonderful. about Japanese gardens is that they take three generations to mature at least. Right. Um, you want all of this moss, you see, it's, it's all self-sown yeah. and... You, know, you don't beautiful. plant it, it but just occurs. Interestingly enough, here in this Japanese garden, I am spotting two native orchids. Pyramidal orchids, absolutely. Yeah. Self-sown, like so many things in this garden. The, the box is very much where it falls, it lies. And then you manage it from there. And of course, it's on a rock, which is, you know, 10 tons of rock, yeah. which was taken across on, on rollers in the Roman fashion, um, pulled by a digger by my father from um, some, some yards so away, your some put hundred yards here. away. Yes, he placed that there. So that oh is his island. And then goodness. the whole of the idea of this garden is really based around that sort of Chinese cosmological idea of the north and south, east and the west. These stones, you see the scales yeah, of the yeah, dragon of here? This is these two of the dragons coming down to drink and, and to, to, to steal the pearls which are under the temple. It's and so it's all the stories are in there, woven stunning. in, but, but in a subtle way. Okay, it's just stunning and beautiful. But I have to say, it's something about those two orchids mm. there. I'm going to tell you what I'm thinking right now. Those are your parents, because they're oh, English, bless. right there. Well, you, there here they are, they are. Right at the here heart, you are. The Englishness at That's the heart right. of the Japanese. The Japanese garden, and there are yeah. your parents who really took this yeah. on. And still do, of course. Yeah, My father's course. still driving his digger. Exactly. Um, uh, uh, as his oh. retirement project, as it was his profession. Uh, <laughs> As a it's, professional amateur yeah, gardener, as he calls himself. It's so, wonderful. You know, it is lovely. And he's still here every evening, you know, moving the rocks yeah. around, sorting things out, sort of working out which moss to leave yeah. and the rest of it. Of course, the thing about this garden is it's so different to everything else, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's no. Cooler, it's cooler, it's, it's damp. It's, yeah, it's it definitely is. It. And I yeah. think it's more peaceful in many ways. It's very peaceful. I'm spending the day visiting the stunning Grade 1 listed gardens at Eiford Manor in southwest England. The gardens have developed over the past 100 years from the vision of Harold Pito, who lived here in the early 20th century. And in 2016, our dear friends William and Marianne were handed the reins to lead Eiford into the future. One of the gifts that I think my mother gave us was, um, and bear in mind, she took over Eiffel 50 years prior, um, was to say, essentially, to leave a spinning chair in the office. She sort of pretty much just went. And she said to me, I remember very vividly, she said to me, I know I'm gonna hate a number of things that you do, but do it anyway, because you need to run at it. You need to go at it just as I did. And I think that was an amazing gift, because it meant that Marianne and I could really start to make the changes that we felt were necessary. Eiford has been welcoming visitors since 1910, when Harold Pito was in the midst of transforming the Georgian Gardens into a glorious celebration of all the places he had visited. 
And now, with the completion of one of William and Marianne's first projects, visitors can enjoy the wonderful food in the new restaurant and cafe, which is run by amazing head chef, Jack Brewer. Hello. Hello. Oh, look, a um, little posy of pansies. Yeah, because I, I hear we're making sort of cakes and maybe some tea sandwiches, but I thought we could put some Thank edible so flowers much. on them. Is, is that it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Is, Thank is you that, so is much. Is that enough? No. <laughs> <laughs> but we can, I, I've bought some in as well, so okay. we can make, we'll, okay. we'll use these, I promise you. I've never made a proper afternoon tea before. Have you not? Okay, well. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so let's go through and now let uh, wash hands. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. There we go. I mean, you know, we all know how to wash our hands <laughs> really well now. This is where your station is going to be. Oh, great. And we're making a little nod to the Japanese garden, uh, the Pito garden. So there's some yuzu in here, which is a lovely tropical juice. Um, so I've mixed up some yuzu and mm. cucumber and cider vinegar and then chive butter. Oh my goodness. And then we've got this yes, spread on here on very plain white bread, the cheapest bread you can buy. <laughs> it's true, so it's, but it's, it's, they make the best sandwiches, yeah. they really yeah. do. Then you're folding this over and then we're going to cut them beautifully. So we're going to be cutting um, just into three samples like this and then okay. we're putting onto the plate here. Okay. Right. Okay. That's your brief. That that's my brief. You're making okay. one sandwich. This is like me. quite an extravagant, beautiful, aren't they? Tea sandwich here. I'm. I can't wait to taste it. I'm gonna just tell William and Marianne that I made the whole thing. No, I'm just kidding. No, no, no. <laughs> and then we'll dress them with edible flowers. So, so I'm gonna so fold it over. Fold it over, and then you're cutting off this, the. Okay. I don't know whether our parents okay. would be very happy with us doing this, cutting okay. off the crusts, and let's be good for so you. So all the crusts. All the crusts, really neatly. And the whole thing about afternoon tea, in my opinion, is it's really precision. Okay. It's beautiful, beautiful food. Jack, I don't know if you know this, but the family that I married into actually invented the sandwich. Did they? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, they'll be so proud of you today. Well, <laughs> here's the thing. You'd think that I would know how to make tea sandwiches. Yeah. But the sandwich that the fourth Earl was, well, invented and it was named after him was actually, you know, in one sense, you know, roast beef between two pieces of bread and it became the sandwich, the lunchtime sandwich that we all know. Not, not, not yeah. this. No, this is something completely different. It's, yeah. yeah. And it is, and it's, it's such a treat to go out for afternoon tea. Every American, I'm certain, that has visited, you know, Britain has come here to have yeah. their afternoon tea. We just don't have the same wonderful you know, tradition. Top cutting Was that? there. Yeah, wonderful. Top now cutting. turn it round again. Okay. Super. Yeah. And then cut it into three. So you've got equal sizes. Okay, equal sizes. I mean, I have known chefs to measure. Oh my sandwiches. goodness. I know, it's that, it's that much of an art okay. skill. Okay, okay. Yep, Is that lovely. right, what do you think? That's, that's good, we'll go with that. Perfect. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so if we just, then if you just kind of turn them up on the side so that they feel, so that you can actually see the, Ah, the okay, filling. this one I have to just do a quick. Yeah. Don't tell anybody. Okay. So turn them up like this. That's super. <gasps> oh my goodness. See how I beautiful that, that looks? Yep. I'm going to turn And then this we're up. just going to, you're just going to drape the tendrils, the little pea shoot tendrils over. Oh my gosh. It's beautiful. Okay, I'm just making sure it's covered. Yeah, that's her. Top okay. work. Absolutely wonderful. Well, well done. So this one's, okay. Okay, there we yep, go. Well done. Beautiful. Like this? Yes, well yeah. done. Oh Top my work. gosh. Well, I'm learning from the best. So that is <laughs> Thank true. You. Right, now we're going to decorate some cakes. Okay, this let's is go. Exciting. With, my, this is with my edible with flowers. With your, your edible flowers. Let's do it. <laughs> so here we are in the bakery now, and uh, this is a chance to go mm. crazy. I've made a clementine and almond syrup cake. Oh. with its, So before it was um, ganached, I made um, like a a drizzle for it, right. lemon and orange and sugar. Okay. Which when the cake came out of the oven, I just washed it over, kept washing it over so it filtrated into the, the cake. So it's like, it makes it not heavy, it's a very light cake, but it makes it so delicious I mean, and moist. Okay, I'm just gonna ask you this question because obviously I'm not a baker, I'm not a chef, but ganached. Great word, isn't it? I know. What does really, ganache mean? Really like. Ganache means, so you melt chocolate, dark cacao, yeah. and butter together. Then you add some honey and cognac in there. <gasps> Cheeky. Oh. Um, and then it gives it the most beautiful glaze. 
which oh is really lovely. Goodness. That's a ganache. So it's been ganached. Gan yeah. Ganache? <laughs> it's been ganached, ganached already for you, Julie. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's and my new favourite word. If we move <gasps> to the flowers. So we have your lovely bunch. And this is where you knock yourself out. These are beautiful. They're gorgeous, aren't they? So we've got another little surprise, which we're going to be using the pink palette, which I was talking to you about. How oh, wonderful! Yes. How wonderful you match. <laughs> Thank That's you. Great, isn't it? You knew. And then the orange is going to go beautifully with the, the cake yes. here. So I think it's over to you. Okay. So I'm going to pick. You want to get a little bit of kind of height in there and ah, and facing out. Exactly. That looks amazing. Some I've got some little nasturtium flowers, uh, sorry, leaves that you could actually pop on if you so want. So would you do, would you put it on top? Do you see how I've just put it on top there? Yeah, or no? I would. Yeah, no, definitely. That's too big. Anything goes. Anything goes. Okay, like that. I think that's stunning. Really? I think you've done a fantastic <gasps> job. Okay, well, thank you. All right, what's up next? Oh, An angel cake. Oh my. Which oh is my just <gasps> the lightest thing you'll ever eat. In the middle of the cake, yes. you've got raspberries and blueberries. So when you cut into it, they tumble out, or they should do. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's the plan. I'm sure growing up in America, yes, angel cake, yeah, right? it's a thing. It's an American. That's why I okay. did it. It's oh an my gosh. <laughs> it's an American like, recipe. I'm sure America, we'd have angel cake. So you did it yeah. on behalf of I did. the token American. <gasps> yeah. it's and it's a, it's a showstopper. It I really mean, is a showstopper. Beautiful. So in a nod to what you're wearing, which I didn't actually know, and the raspberries, etc. knock yourself okay. out with no, the... Uh, I'm going to go pink vibes, yeah, right? Definitely. So, I definitely think pink is the way it Okay, and go. just sort of like... You put it anywhere you like. I mean, it's not quite nice to have a sort of a bit of a sweet dress, you know, just dress the cake. Okay, but basically. avoid the raspberries. Okay, I really need like, no, 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 guidance you can, I here. mean, there are raspberries inside, so if you want to take them off, I just put them on there. Yeah, I love it, I love it. Okay, I'm going to kind of like go like that, maybe. I don't know, fix Beautiful. it. Jack, you need to fix what I'm, you know, <laughs> what I'm doing I'm, here. Look at that. I feel like this leaf. Yeah, it might, yes. Yeah, see, what you can also do, what I just, just pick off the petals. Seems like a bit of an ouch moment, but they look really pretty <gasps> just drizzling over the top. Just, oh. I mean, beautiful. It's, it's just beautiful. It's just a lovely colour anyway. It is beautiful. Could not find your outfit better as well. I know. So darn I somehow knew. <laughs> <gasps> look at this. There you go. Okay, there. You see, I think now, that's a work of art. I, I do too. The cloister, built in 1914 in the early medieval Romanesque style, is a grade two listed building. Being here, you feel like you're stepping back in time to the sun-drenched hills of Tuscany. It's a building which represents a number of things, but essentially, as we came in, there was this inscription, the haunt of ancient peace. It's from a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson, uh, The Palace of Art. It's well worth a read. It's, um, it's all about creating a space that's very sacred to you personally. And this is this sacred space for Harold Peter. He creates it and places in it his objects that he treasures the most, that mean the most to him. And also it creates a sense of peacefulness, ancient peace. Interesting set of words. It is interesting. Ancient peace is this idea that it's been here longer than we have, that we are just newcomers, that this is the, the, the standard status here is peacefulness. We're the kind of aggressor into that. We're trampling on that, right. potentially. So, right. so beware, traveller, that you need to respect the awesome ancient peace that exists. And, and this is that space. Just a couple of years after William and Marianne took on Eiford, they were faced with an unbelievably daunting problem. The spectacular building was in grave danger of disappearing into dust. One problem we had in this building is that, as with all these buildings that Pito put up, he didn't put a foundation under it. So we have a 100 millimeter, four inch foundation on pounded fuller's earth. Fuller's what? earth is a really expandable clay. <gasps> so in the dry weather, we didn't have rain here for six months in 2018, so it collapsed the clay layer and the building was nearly lost. Oh so, my goodness. So it was quite a challenge. We took out everything from this all the way around to the far corner over there and it was, um, it was quite everything. a job. Yeah, pretty much. So everything below the arches. And it was pinned with steels to hold the roof up. Everything was taken away, numbered, you know, stone yep, by stone. Yep. 
And then we dug down by hand, no machinery in here, of course, you can't get in. No, 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 of course. Um, and took out the fuller's earth, replaced it with a concrete foundation, built it back, numbered stones, replaced the columns in their right orientation, resized, etc. Oh, my goodness. And then, of course, we, we um, took the scaffold away, and that was the terrifying moment. The engineer right. just Is came and did it on a Sunday evening without anyone <laughs> knowing, actually. And hopefully, that it's gives it a sense of yep. continuity for the future, which is, of course, the sustainable approach that we're all trying to come up with for our heritage. Absolutely, but you know, I know that you also won the Historic Houses Restoration Award. We did, it was very generous of them in, to give it In to 2020, us. because how long did this take? This well, work? this was an eight month project. Right. We finished in March of 20, but of course the judges couldn't visit right. yeah. during COVID. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so that award was made this year. And it was very generous of them to give it to us. I'm sure the, the other projects were magnificent, but I think this was so technical, yes. so challenging for people to understand how to deal with an, a fully arched structure. There's no lintels in this building at all. It's entirely arches. So if you move something, everything else moves. And that was the great challenge. So, right. so I think the engineers should really get the credit for this. The workmen, the craftsmen, they always give the prize to the wrong people, don't they? You know, the guy who just commissions the work. But, but ultimately, this is about the amazing work of yeah. the people who built it. Absolutely. And, and definitely well-deserved. I mean, absolutely. Because you're right, it is that technical. It's not like anything's changed as far as the restoration. But we also have to remember that restoration doesn't just mean, you know, stripping things back, revealing something else. It means making sure that this stay standing for future generations. Absolutely, and that is the whole point of creating the restaurant, the cafe that you've seen when you're with Jack, of creating all of those spaces to create some sort of revenue that will enable the gardens to survive long into the future. These places shouldn't be parasites of no. a community or the, the people who live in them. They should be living and breathing in, in, engaged with their community, and that's what we seek to do over the next 10, 20, 30 years, so that Horatio, hopefully, or his brother or sister or whatever, can want to inherit this and yes. see it as a real positive benefit to their lives. Yeah. And it seems like such a silly thing to say when you live in such a beautiful place. But actually, you can wake up in the morning, you know this, you wake up I, in the morning and you think, oh, which tree's fallen over oh, today? Yeah, actually, or which leak? Right, which <laughs> leak am I going to deal yeah. with today? Actually, it's, it's about creating an environment where there is the funds available, where there are the funds available to fix the leaks, to sort the trees out, to make it sustainable for the long-term future. That's really the point of conservation heritage. Now, of course, you round the corner, and then suddenly you have this view to the valley beneath. And I think this is the reserved secret right for the end of the visit that Harold Pito wants you to see. Do you see the weir on the river? Yeah, absolutely. It's the, the source, I think, of that ancient peace, that sense that this has been continuously flowing. It's never quiet in the Eiffel Valley. No. You always hear this white noise. And white noise attenuates other things in the distance. It makes things calmer. You know, you put white, white noise to get your kids to sleep. Yeah, right? no, absolutely. So it's all of that. And it's that sense of positive energy of the movement of water. And I think that's at the heart of what absolutely. the ancient peace is. Absolutely. Wonderful. How spectacular. And now <gasps> it's time for tea. I 100% agree. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I'm certain Harold Pito would be overjoyed that his gardens have been revived and nurtured by the Cartwright Hignets, and soon a new baby will join William's family to enjoy growing up in this magical place. We've got the whole family here. Very exciting. <laughs> Very, and I'm sure your bump is going to want some cake. Oh, I would think sugar Tea. is always popular with right. bumps, isn't it? I, I cannot believe this spread. But I do love egg mayonnaise, which I would say the American way, I'm afraid, is egg salad. Um, oh, yeah, we say egg salad. I cannot resist the chocolate and the edible flowers, so I am going to uh, dive straight into that. <laughs> the whole point of an angel cake is that it should tumble forth yes, upon entry. It is it worth finding a knife? <laughs> okay. And I feel Julie should do it. I, I feel so. It so she dressed it so beautifully. Gosh, I'm very nervous. Right. All right, Jack, I'm gonna. Good luck. I'm gonna make a dent. Number one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. This. I hope I've done justice to America. I, I, I. Oh my. You're right. What's inside? <gasps> it's so like. I'm just gonna make sure I get my nice little corner here. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. 
Let's get that on a plate. Wow, look at that. Look at that. Oh, and there's some cascading wow. berries. You're right, where the center hole was. So I'm just going to sneak these on. Look at that. Look at that. Isn't that fun? <gasps> wow, I've this... never seen an angel cake before. Uh, Have you had an angel cake? No. I've never no, seen I one. I've never beheld an one in my vision. <laughs> this that is, is so exciting. Fantastic. Should we do it? Yeah. No, we should. Do you want the icy end or the fruity I'll end? I'll take the icy end. I'll there you go. The icy end. Okay. Dive in. Go on. Are, are we... Yeah, we're totally yeah. doing that. Okay. <laughs> Cheers. Well, Cheers. Thank you to everybody for such a wonderful time here it's at Eifert. Great to see you. All of you um, for really spending your time with me, but also just for me to be able to experience, you know, what ancient peace really means. Well, cheers to cheers that. Cheers to that. <laughs> perfect. Mm. Perfect for ratio. Mm. Mm. That's amazing. Isn't it? It's light. Who knew Americans make cake? It... <laughs> you now know. <laughs>
by Ted and Sarah Corriton and their family, it is now managed by daughter Sammy as an exclusive wedding and private hire home from home. It's the first time I visited Pentilly and I can't wait to see Sammy again. All right, something is going on here. There are chairs. Okay. Wow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that is not what I expected to see. I was like, where's, where's Sammy? And then all of a sudden I see this machine. Hi. Hi. Welcome to Pantilly. How are you? Don't meet my leaf blower. Sorry, I'm not the expert, but. Um, all hands to the pump today. To well, okay, so tell me what is happening here because there's uh, obviously... very tidy, but it looks very tidy. <laughs> You're tidying up. We are tidying up. So there's been a wedding right. this weekend. So yeah, there's chairs needing to go in and out. Turn the house around basically, ready for guests tonight. Oh, yeah. my, oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, okay, this is spectacular. This is good. The it's drive also... was fantastic. And you brought beautiful weather so you can come again anytime you like. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Absolutely, I will. Um, but okay, so you're tidying up for a wedding, so you're obviously busy. Yeah, come and help I, me. I will come and help you. Yeah, yeah perfect. That's what and I like to the do. The leaf blower for you, Judy? I'm going to leave the case. leaf blower <laughs> in your we'll very it capable hands. We'll need it for confetti in a minute, so <laughs> come on through. Wonderful. I'm yeah. walking into a castle. You are I a mean, little one, did I know. But it's well, still a castle. Pentilly. Absolutely. I don't want to drop your bags yeah. there. That would be amazing. Perfect. <laughs> She's totally taking oh. liberties with guests arriving. I like love this. it. She's not normally allowed in the house, so we'll. well I <laughs> would love her. At least the hoovering hasn't happened quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. In this room, wedding parties celebrate under the sparkle of the Waterford crystal chandeliers and the watchful eye of the first happy couple of Pentilly. We've got Sir James Tilly and Elizabeth, his wife. Right. So Sir James Tilly built the house in 1698. So very important man for us. Very important man. Is that who I? That's yes, who I passed there. Met him on his that's, statue at the front. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. So he built the house 1698. Yeah. 220 yeah. something, something years, years ago. ago. Okay. Oh, so okay. Yeah. 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 So he built the house in 1698, and yeah, he chose I think a pretty good spot. Look at this view. What do you think? Oh my goodness. Hello, England. Hello, that's, that's England. And the weather. And the weather. And that this is, is Cornwall. England. That's England. This is Cornwall. But this is what, you know, every American thinks, and everybody around the world, when you come to England, this is the view that the you think of. The green and pleasant land. Yes. The you, say? <laughs> you put it Sorry, perfectly. So cliche. And the, the big lawn for croquet match or whatever. And. <laughs> Right. The tidy up begins here. Confetti needs to be cleared up and well, Hello. This so, is Chrissy, our wedding coordinator. Julie. Julie. So you are the wedding coordinator. Well, this is fantastic. I mean, I kind of wish I had gotten married here. How many weddings do you do a year? Uh, around about 25 to 30. Right. Um, That's a lot. Different sizes. Yeah. Um, from Diddy. Diddy. Diddy Tiny Ones were just two, which is so lovely. You can feel the emotion in the rooms. They are absolutely spectacular right the way through to weddings with 200 people down here on the on the lawn with a marquee incredible yeah. every single one is different they are they're all memorable for their own right reasons it's lovely and i love it that you're in your heels ah. they're fantastic <laughs> <Aim> <laughs> <high>. <laughs> that's right aim Chrissy high. loves a heel. i on the other hand do not no, no, you're same with me but sammy how long have you been having weddings here because that's a big part of your business since, here at pentelli right yeah it is actually so since before we opened so 2008 was the first one Right, so um, so that's going for a good 13 years now. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, if you count, you know, the year that didn't exist. <laughs> but it's a big, it's a big part of your business here. It is, it's, yeah. Weddings it, and, I, and private hire. So families come and they stay for the whole, for the whole weekend, don't they, Chrissy? They take over the castle for they do. two or three days. Yeah, or even a week. What can I do to help? Well, we need I, to get the get the confetti cleared. So okay, um, this is quite tedious, isn't it? Yeah. The, it's uh, natural petal confetti, though. That we make here from, from the flower bed. Do you know what? <laughs> so much for this. I'm going to get that leaf blower, Julia. You can Are have you? a go with the leaf blower. Can I have a go? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I was hoping you were going to ask me that. I need to try out that leaf blower. Are you ready? 
Are you ready? I don't, I don't think I am. <laughs> what? Well, do you like glasses? I don't bother with the glasses. Okay, you can, yeah. We can, I'll give them to you once you've got this on. It's quite heavy. Okay. It looks Come very around, heavy. Come okay. <laughs> Come on, the okay. Side of the, okay. Oh my gosh. Lower. Oh my gosh. Sammy, I did not expect <laughs> this when I was you coming ready? for a visit. This is heavy. Okay. Should we pop the yeah, glasses on? Yeah, put the glasses on. Okay. Well, you look so fat. Yeah, I know. I mean, this is going to be a new look for me. <laughs> we need to try and start this. If this starts, winner, winner. If okay. not, we'll be shouting for some okay. support and help. Look, hang on. I feel like a transformer in this. This might never stop. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to try this. Here we go. Right, okay, pump it in. Oh, okay. Come on. Chris, <laughs> you're the detective. <laughs> it will start. It will. I know. Oh, my goodness me. Chrissy enthusiastically steps in. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. Ready? Yep. Then producer Victoria gets all fired up. <laughs> I've got Neil. Can this go in the behind the scenes, please? But when girl power falters, oh, Sammy calls in reinforcements. And with Ted, Sammy's father triumphant, it's full throttle ahead. I did, I felt like, you know, a Ghostbuster. Yeah, too right. Do you know what I mean? Oh my God, part. it was so exhilarating, but it's like the vibration. I'm a bit sort of like <laughs> right now. Amazing, well, thank you enormously. Oh, Job anytime. done. Anytime, this is what I love to do. Yeah, do you know what I mean? I pop in for an overnight stay <laughs> and put me hard to yeah, work. So, well, the leaves are, it's, it's autumn, isn't it? So the leaves will be coming off the trees anytime. So yeah, come back in about a month. And dare <laughs> I say that it's like, Warm here in England? I know, warm in Cornwall. You see, it's Cornwall, it's, isn't it? It's Cornwall. Summer it's, sunshine, so yeah. Um, Thanks for bringing the southern channel and everything, but we're done. So that's good. We're done. And right. We're done. Sorted. So glad I could help out. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to have to like. Glass go, of water? Yeah, a glass of water. <laughs> right, should I bring this back? Oh my yeah, goodness, it's like a that? monster. No. Yeah. yeah, I've got it. Got the we're beast. friends now. We're friends now. <laughs> we're friends now. Should I grab one side? Okay. Yeah, yeah maybe. Camera. Okay, wait. <laughs> Hold on. I got this. Right, we're sorted. It's a bit of a beast, isn't it? It is a bit of a beast, it's but it works. It, it gets does. the job done. So come on through. Very the book is impressed. The through there, oh but we'll show goodness. you all of this later. Come on through. If you don't mind, shoes off. Of course. Ridiculous Out. beige carpet. Whose idea was that? No, <laughs> we have Just the same rule. We have the same rule. Yeah, it's shoes wonderful. off is always good. Can I take this for you? No, no. I've, I've got it. Sure? I, I promise you. I promise you. All right. So, how many bedrooms are there here? Uh, we have eleven bedrooms. So one downstairs on the ground floor, eight double ensuite bedrooms on this level, mm. and then two up in the turrets. The castle in the turret. turret. In the turret. The <laughs> they must be very popular. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I want to sleep in a turret. <laughs> You're very welcome. But instead, I've given you the chorus in bedrooms. Okay. So this is oh. one of my favorites. Okay. Oh, and you've given me such great views. It's a goodie, isn't Look it? at this. Yeah, down it's over the river. incredible. You know, you are running this now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Quite daunting. Right. And sometimes brilliantly. <laughs> But I've only been here Often for like a dreadfully. <laughs> but I've only been here for like a nanosecond. Yeah. And you're on the go all the time. Is this what it's like most days? 
Yes, but I think it's probably the same for you guys, isn't it? There's always, yeah, there's always. There's always something. There's always isn't something. It? So it's always, you, you have a plan for the day. I try yeah. and have a plan for the week. And quite often I still haven't turned my laptop on and it's 10 past three and it's time to go and collect the children from school. So it's a bit of a juggle, but I think that's the same in every house like this, isn't it? Yeah. It's but it's, just, I mean, there's lots going on. Yeah, every house, but this is a castle. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's got a couple of turrets. But yeah, I'm going to throw the sheet at you and let's okay. get this done and then we can get you a comfortable okay. bed for this evening. Can you um, go around the other side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, are you like an expert at making beds? I pretend to be when I need to be. <laughs> down there. Okay. What about the corners? How are yeah, you on corners? Are you any good at hospital corners? Let's just do this one first. Hospital good corners. Do you know a hospital corner? Right. So no. Then, okay, I'll show you. So down underneath, pull it underneath and tight. Yeah. Tight, tight, tight. Yeah. Now get this bit that's all drapey down here. Yeah. And go like that. Okay. Go like that. Yeah. And then okay. tuck what's dangling underneath. <laughs> okay. That's yeah. it. And then bring the bit that was foldy up here. Yeah. Down and then you've got a nice tight, tight corner. Since the 19th century, nurses would use this method to make beds for their patients. I think we both need practice. I haven't done one for a yeah. while. So Pentilly was a maternity hospital in the Second World War. So we quite like our hospital corners. We take it all back to when there was ladies having their babies oh. here during the war, which is quite during fantastic. The war. And why was that? Why did it become a maternity hospital? Well, we are just 20 minutes from Plymouth, so down the river, and then the Blitz. And the Alexandra Nursing Home in Plymouth was, you know, one of the places that might be might be attacked right. or, or right. suffer under a bomb threat. So. Um, the Pentilly and another house the other side of the river in Devon were both requisitioned as maternity hospitals. You're kidding So me. Pentilly was a maternity ward. Sort of all during the Second World War, actually. We haven't done very well at this end. No, have I haven't. I'm um, just going to kind of watch you again. So under. Yeah. Yeah. And then bring this bit that's all dangly. So you've got some to dangle, the side bit. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what's going on over there. Tuck that bit under. Okay. And then the okay, side okay, bit. Okay, yeah. And then the side bit. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Housekeeping are going to laugh at me. They're going to say, oh, Sammy, that's No, they're going to look at my side and they're going to be like, she is rubbish. Well, between us, <laughs> we both could do a bit more practice, couldn't we? I mean, I could. I don't think you need a bit more practice, oh, but this is... Sort of okay, practice. I'm happy. Let's do are. that. Tuck it under. I'm, I'll have to bring this back to Matt Britton. <laughs> Hospital corners. There we are. That's quite okay. nice, isn't it? It's nice. I'm it's happy to sleep on this. I'm very excited to Perfect. sleep on this. And that's duvets, which always are hilarious when we get lost in a duvet, but... Oh dear. Uh, no, 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 you're good. That one. Okay, here, with yeah. my hand. Grab. And then pull it through. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's right. Genius. There okay. we are. Done. Look. <laughs> you have such I've an made my bed. night's sleep. <laughs> this is brilliant. It was like really comfy, except once this every bed really didn't have any cover. I my own bed. What was amazing when we first came here to Pentilly, um, right. we invited some babies and some mums to, to come and have tea. And this one lady arrived and she had rode here from Plymouth when she was in labour, which is quite impressive. She rode she up rode. the river in yeah. labour yeah. to get to Pentilly yeah. during the war. Yeah. That's that amazing, isn't it? And, she's, she, and you, she came back to visit? She came back to visit, yeah, with her son, which was wonderful and amazing. With so the that was son that was born here? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. But then the castle was th three quarters bigger. I forgot to say that bit. That was pretty important because it's not... That many reason, you know, eight bedrooms probably isn't enough for a whole maternity hospital. But the castle was three quarters bigger, so the courtyard you arrived in was this, a central courtyard, and so that there was another wing out there and another wing out there. But it was all knocked down in the 60s, so we're left with, I suppose, a third of what was here. But you can have that one. Thank you. Fantastic. Oh, yeah, I like a little zhuzh. A little zhuzh. Zhuzh. There we are. Over the past 50 years, Pentilly has undergone some dramatic changes, but since the family inherited the castle in 2007, they have transformed it into the most magical and tranquil place to stay. I met up with Sammy's mother, Sarah Corriton, who explained how much the castle has changed over the years. You've done a lot to this castle, is that um, right? I think we have done quite a lot to this castle. It was a very uh, sort of dead space, perfectly livable in. Right. Um, but it was a very, de just a dead space, very, um, just needed some life and some love. But I kind of knew what I wanted. 
if yeah. that makes any sense. Yes. And I sort of knew what, I didn't want wallpapers and all that sort of thing. Um, I just wanted it as plain as possible because actually at that stage we didn't even know what we were going to do with the whole house. Was it going to be a livable prospect? Quickly became obvious that it wasn't. Um, and so then what we were going to do if you've got the general public in and lots of parties going on, there's no point in having wallpaper which has got to be redone yes. <laughs> after every, every wedding and so it was paint and I knew the sort of colours I wanted. Yeah, it's very, it's, 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 it's a clean, welcoming colour. Good. So, yeah, exactly. so I really exactly. like that. So you've then taken, in, obviously not here, but you've taken all of pretty much kind of the the shell of the yeah. castle, if you yeah. like, and the interiors. Yeah. A lot, of it, a lot of it, and, and we've done and it. Certainly from, the, from this, 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 this point on, but this is actually one of my most favourite bits. Right here. Did, yeah. um, this is my military war, what I call my military war, because um, all Ted's relations, uh, this is Geoffrey Corrison, who he, his first cousin, who he inherited Pentilly from. Ah. He was actually the second son, the first, the eldest son was ah. killed in um, El Alamein, and then Geoffrey inherited but ah. as the second son, okay. and then he came here to, um, to run the house, and they ran, um, you know, had a, a very lovely life, but not a great deal. I mean, they, they, had, they had chefs and cooks and things, and they had no children, and right. they then just lived here, but it was very sterile, is the only way I could describe it, hugely sterile. But right. anyway, we, so we then had to make it a, a sort of livable home, even if you're coming to here to, as, a, as a paying guest. Yes. Uh, but one of my most favourite things is the, the guests who are not the paying guests, who are the military veterans, who um, we have here twice a year. And they come and stay for a week. They either have... Um, they can do exactly what they want. They can have yoga and meditation. They can do clay pigeon shooting. They can canoe. They can paddleboard. They can paint. Because yeah. they suddenly found that since they become veterans, they, they're now able to develop these amazing talents which maybe they didn't know they had. Listening to Sarah, I'm realizing what a special place Pentilly is and how much these walls have to tell. This is the most amazing bit, I think, of Radio Pentilly because um, it was done by our, the plasterer who was working on the house and he was in the house and it was, it was Poppy Day 2008. My son was in Afghanistan as well, so it was a pretty poignant day. And um, when we'd had our two minute silence, um, I came back in here and I found him just slashing this into the raw, this the was plaster, all raw plaster. The plaster. This, yeah, because this was all just newly plastered. And yeah. the tears streaming down <gasps> his face. And he was broken, oh he was absolutely blessed, but coming, all his horrors coming back from his service in Bosnia and Croatia. It's and completely marvellous. And I said, I want that to remain. And he said, no, no, no. I said, Yes, yes, yes. And he said, I didn't even spell Afghan right. <laughs> and I said, I just... Because he was in a moment of... of well, whatever, yeah, 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 absolutely. Does he... It, doesn't, it, it is... doesn't matter. And I love it. I yeah, love it. And, I, it's, I... and that's really what... It, it's, that's what Pentil is about. To me, it's part of the thing that it gives out for, for sort of healing. Sarah takes me across the estate to a very special place which the veterans have uncovered for the first time in 70 years. On a sunny hillside, the Victorian walled kitchen garden is being brought back to life. In the 1950s, it took five gardeners to tend the two and a half acre garden to produce fruit and vegetables for the castle. But today, it's a place where nature is giving so much more. And here you have the beginnings of the great sanctuary of the kitchen garden. And all the sort of things that we've been doing with the boys is that some of them didn't want to grow veggies, but they right. wanted to expose all the, the old cobbles which haven't been exposed for, for years and years and years, because all along here was junk and filth and muck and I can't even call it compost, but rubbish that had just been stuck there for well, the last 70 years, I suppose. So they, they come here, in, and this is just one element within sort of the castle that they, and the grounds that they can come to, and it's this is where they are, this is safe. Yeah. They're totally safe. Um, and um, when I say they're safe, they just feel secure. Yes. Um, and uh, there's always somebody with them in case there's a bit of a meltdown that goes on. You never know what that sudden peace brings on. Of course. Um, and uh, we've just, they just do whatever they would like to do, whether it's grow the seeds or whether it's grow the weeds or learn how to take little cuttings or to make it look better, as in the sort of potting shed there, which you, they've uncovered wonderful old tools and the swallows in and out, in and out, in and out, so wonderful. So this is really a place that they feel, the war heroes really feel that they can come and just be 
they can do if they need to do something and they feel they want to, but they also can just feel safe. They can feel, I think the main thing is that they feel safe. They haven't got to worry if somebody's coming behind them or um, anything like that. And they can have their cup of tea, they can weed, they can plant, they can just sit. And um, quite what we, well, just the other day we had a, a lovely barbecue. We're hoping to be able to expand it to be able to do either more days or definitely more veterans because right. as you can see it's needing a lot of hands to hold it under control but they have done an amazing job it's like fighting through a jungle when we um, when we started well, no i mean it's a vast kitchen garden i mean yeah. this is vast and i've also you know i've spotted um a couple of Peacock. Oh yes. Is that right? We have got <laughs> we've got seven peacocks and You've got seven peacocks. consequently everything's sort of barricaded against them um, peacock damage because they'll eat absolutely everything. And we even found them getting in the greenhouse eating the um, the grapes off the vine. But I, su I suspect that the veterans must like that coming here, having a cup of tea and being surrounded by peacocks. <laughs> Pentilly Castle stands on the banks of the River Tamar in Cornwall. It's been home to the Corriton family for over 300 years. Hidden in a far corner of the estate is a monument to Sir James Tilly, who built the castle in the late 17th century. And there's the, the mausoleum. Splendid. I mean, just extraordinary. So this. This was built, this is a folly, it, 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 so, Yes, a folly, but it didn't have any real purpose. But I think it was built in about 16, 1670, 1680. Right. Um, with Timmy Tilly anticipating or wanting to come up here and read a book and drink wine and get away from a nagging wife. Right, so, so he <laughs> built this, he yes, commissioned this. Yes, it. I think so. There's right, no record of it right, before. Right, and so this was his escapism, if you like. And I, I, I think so. I've and I suspect a, I, he was able to look out and be like, Mm, look at what, this what view. a great man am I. Oh, I've, right, I've yeah. got a little wooden shed in a field over there that I use for the same purpose. <laughs> <laughs> not quite as grand or spectacular <laughs> no, as this. No, it's not. So are we allowed to go Yeah, in? yes, of course we are. Okay. Wonderful. It was in terrible condition, but we spent a certain amount of time restoring it. So it's all held together with stainless steel now. So this is um, where James Tilly would come and just... Well, the win there used to be windows either side, and I think there was a, originally a flat roof, a belvedere, so you could go up and sit, stand on the roof and look at the view. Oh, and right. then I think the Victorians added a butterfly roof over, over that. You can see the view of the roof. Yes, 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 I can see that. So this is him. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's Here he very, is. Very fine statue of him. I think it must have been made after his death because the sculpture wasn't very complimentary of his figure, was he? Right, no, but, he wasn't. But he, the reason he's here is that in his will, he said that he wanted to be placed in his favourite chair, wired to it so he didn't fall over, dressed in his best clothes with his books and his fine wines, uh, and to be taken to the building on Mount Ararat, and this is Mount Ararat, um, and to await resurrection. So it must have been quite an arrogant character to think that he was actually going to be and resurrected. It doesn't happen often, does it? No. That we know of. And they... Uh, and, they uh, and the story goes that he, 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 they brought him up here. Oh, they did. They followed yeah. his direction. Yeah. And, and when we came here, the, the statue was in a right. terrible state. When Ted and the family took over the running of Pentilly, nature had reclaimed the building. Um, so this... That had fallen out and was lying on right. the floor. And, and all the leaves had come off and the skull had come off. The skull means victory over death. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> just, I didn't know that. No, nor did I. Victory um, over death. So he really did think he was going to be resurrected. Well, I think so. In 2013, a restoration operation began to preserve the monument for the future. We got a wonderful conservation firm to take him to pieces. And, and it was about 180 pieces scattered all over the place. 180 pieces. And, and they put him together. They took him Did up they? to a workshop in Bath uh, and put him together. He, he didn't have any, any feet left and his, his hands had gone. Right. Uh, and his nose was missing. 
And whether that was through the roof collapsing on the building or the vandalism, we right, don't know. Right, right. 300 years after Sir James Tilly died, his statue was reborn. We could have aged that. No. But, but I, I wanted to show that it was an intervention. It was a recreation. Exactly, and I think uh, absolutely. And you've kept the graffiti on, I see. Absolutely. Yeah. But wouldn't it be wonderful to find out who had actually scratched it? And I know, I know. Are there any dates on here? I'm looking no, for... No, no, none that we can find. None that you can find. How? And the, the chair represents a, um, a lawyer's chair because they used to keep all their papers in it. And so when they're sitting on it, no one could get at the papers. <laughs> no one could get at the, the it private it papers. Would have, would have had a handle there and one the other side, so his servants could carry it from one place to another. During the restoration, something quite extraordinary was uncovered. When we were doing the restoration, we found that the, there was a, a domed vault underneath. The builders came rushing down to the castle and said, there's a vault, there's a vault. So we came tearing up here and found that the was this dome structure with a couple of big granites there. So we lifted the granites eight steps into a vault, into a chamber, with a, a, a body. No. Yeah. No, no, so, no. So he's just sitting there waiting. What? You saw him? <laughs> he's just there, yeah. What? It appears that the dying wishes of Sir James Tilly had been realized. The chair's, the back of it is still propped up against the wall, but it's so fragile you can't touch no, it. No. It's got studs on it which say SRJT. Sir James Tilly. Of course. And did, was there any hidden treasure? No, unfortunately not. His <laughs> books and his fine wine, were, there were no signs of it. How fantastic to be able to restore this, but also to be able to find 300 years later, yes. Sir James Tilly and, lying in the ground and it's or quite, sitting. It's, it's wonderful that people carried out his wishes, isn't it? Yes. Because you know, once you're dead, you've got no, no influence any longer, have you? Right. Well, uh, I feel like we should leave him in peace. And, yeah. you know, I think he's very happy. <laughs> But Here Sarah and Sammy there. keep asking me if I want to join him, and I don't think I do, really. No, I think <laughs> I, you should just leave him to rest. I think I'm happy right this, where he is. this side of the floor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> this landscape is so beautiful, and I'm lucky to be visiting Pentilly in the early autumn. Just the right time of year to go foraging for slow berries in the hedgerows. What I didn't realize was that the hedgerows are surrounded by cows. I just want to tell you that I do have a massive fear of cows, like massive, like I'm chopping right now. Gather. So I have to, like and it's not fake, like this is for real. Like that is frightening. Makes me want to vomit. Oh no, and It's fine, that. but no, I'm not going to do that on you because I really like this. <laughs> and your wellies, so don't make a mess of your new yeah. wellies, come on. So um, you're right to have a fear of cows, uh -huh. but these are okay. We've put the dog in the car. They are mummies and babies. That's yeah. also a thing to be frightened of. But right. they look, they're chilled. They're happy. They've got over there being super inquisitive. Okay. We've got our wranglers. Mm -hmm. And we'll just okay. shout and be bigger than them if they come for lunch. Is that what you do? Is you... Yeah. But they're vegetarian too. They don't want us. Okay. It's fine. Okay. We need to pick some okay. slows. We need to pick some slows. Is that all right? I'm here. Yeah. I'll no, I know. I'll run. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bigger than you. Okay. So, so these... Do... Are you familiar with slows? So here's the thing, to be perfectly honest, and that's what I'm all about, obviously. But <laughs> you know, when I first moved to this country, yeah. and we would, you know, we would have the shoots at Mapperton, and or we'd go on a shoot, and there's yeah. this thing called the Levenses, right? Yeah, yeah, Which yeah. you know very well. Yeah. And people would always offer slow gin, and then when they gave me the slow gin, I was confused because it wasn't clear, and True. I and then I didn't understand. They said no, but it's from slows, and, I'm and like, it makes it quite slow. And I was oh, like, God, what are this. slows? I Try don't, one. I don't think we have slows in America. Or uh, I'm sure we blacks on. I don't know. Maybe do. Delicious. Maybe we don't. What do you think? <laughs> well, I'm trying to stay in the present moment here. What um, do you think? Is your mouth puckering? Yeah. My, it's like it's hard to talk now. <laughs> You're very brave. You didn't have to do that. Well, no, I, I've never tasted one before. Well, there you are. So I was trusting you. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth it. Your face is pretty yep. picture. Um, they're very tannic, so they're very whatever that. You know, yeah. now you need a glass of water, and your lips are yep. going to feel the same. But so, they're, they add, they've got that great acidity, so they make a great, a great. I don't know what do you call it, a liqueur, I guess. So add to a bit of gin, uh -huh. or a bit of, <laughs> or vodka if you wanted to, but and some sugar. So how many slows do you need to make a bottle of gin, slow um, gin? Some. <laughs> some slow, some gin, some sugar, in the quantities you decide. I'm pleased Sammy is here to protect me from the cows, 
but she is also a seasoned forager for sloes. You need to know what you're picking. It's said that sloes are best picked after the first frost when they are slightly softer. Southwest Britain is rich in archeological evidence of ancient settlements. Stone circles are believed to have served a ritual and ceremonial purpose with their position connected to the alignments of the sun and moon. Here at Pentilly, a stone circle dominates this area of the estate where you can see for miles. So this must be quite historical, this stone, stone circle. circle. Right, well, this like well, this, this, wizards, like Stonehenge. Uh, sort of. <laughs> It is the, the oldest unadulterated stone circle in Cornwall. Okay. So it's quite ancient. That, that's ancient. It's unadulterated because my father built it in 2017. <laughs> You're kidding me. So it is the oldest unaltered stone circle in Cornwall, but not like millions on Bobman, which has had <laughs> stones fall over and be picked up and all the rest of it. This one's unchanged since it was built four years ago. Oh my God. So why did your father build this? But, um, but is it, well, because it's an incredible spot, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, but so and a reason to yeah. get people to come up here. So when we've got right. guests coming to stay, they would walk all around the gardens, but there was no real reason to get them up into, yes. into a field full of cows. <laughs> um, so we built the stone circle, so he built the stone circle. But also Dad's absolutely fascinated with the, the history of, you know, when we're on Dartmoor or walking on Bodmin, he's always like, oh, I wonder who walked here. I wonder why they did this. I wonder why they, what are those tracks in the, in the stone? Why did they this? How did they do that? And does, does the circle mean, have any meaning behind it? Or he just, and with the stones, it was just something he's been contemplating for a while. They don't really represent anything, except that these stones, the ones that are further out, yes, are kind the of ones... the leader stones, A, to get you up from the garden, but also where the sun rises in the height of summer. No, winter. Right. Hang on, summer. Yes, going back that way, winter. And then there's one down over there for summer. It's your dad's stone circle. It I mean, is. this is just Ted's a, it's stone circle. Ted's stone circle. Okay. Well, so, let's. Has anybody done yoga all? before in the stone circle? Do you know of? Could we be the first? I haven't. I can't really do very good yoga. We can. We I've can got put some the, sort of stretchy. Legs I know. I put on. mine on too. So I put the slows in there. Yeah. We can do some sun salutations. Oh, good. And that will, in one sense, sort of like you know make these slows produce the best. fantastic <laughs> slow gin. Do you think, do you think it'll have like anti-cold properties and all It's going to have tons of, of antioxidants. Yeah. It's going to boost our immu immune. And, and our energy. And, it, and conquer our fear of cows. Conquer my fear of cows. Fear yeah, of yeah cows. exactly. Okay, yeah. good. So we're just going to stay standing. So, oh, yep. So we're going to inhale, sweep the arms up. Where better with the sun setting to do some yoga? and I think I need it after being in this field with the cows. Hands together. Exhale, heart center. Amazing. I feel better. I love that. Thank and you I, so and much. And I, do I look calmer? Yeah, you feel Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Good. And, good. and these are going to be, these are going to be the best tasting. The best slow gin. <laughs> Pentilli has ever made. Back at the castle, I'm happily meeting up with Sammy's husband, Mark, who actually works in the gin business and has made me a very welcome and refreshing gin and tonic. He's just the person to show me how to make some slow gin. All right, you can see your wife picked a lot. <laughs> I'm, Amazing. I'm afraid there were cows. And so Sammy learned about my fear of cows. So I was picking one and then looking and then picking another one and looking. <laughs> but um, so this is from your wife, really. Well, that's brilliant. <laughs> You've done a, a sterling job there. So thank you. Um, they look amazing. Yeah, so tell me a little bit more because as the American, when I first moved over here, I had never heard of slows. I think we might, maybe we call them something else in America. Okay. But, and I definitely didn't know what slow gin was. And in fact, the first time somebody handed me some slow gin, I didn't think it was gin because of the color of Ribena. it. Ribena. Yeah, I, exactly. <laughs> I was like, what is this? Some black cur current? Yeah. I asked for a gin. And because yeah. um, that's what you think. You think of it as clear. Yeah. So the concept of slow gin 
is? It's one of the things that you sort of, well, as a sort of gin drinker, you look forward to in the winter. Um, so they, so this is essentially a, a, a blackthorn um, right. berry. Um, so um, uh, white flowers in the, in the spring, um, and then you get this uh, this sort of surge of lovely little berries. That you wouldn't want to eat them; they're really tart. S Sammy had uh, me try one, and really? I, uh, yeah, I was just like, "Sure thing!" And then yeah. I was like, I couldn't even, you know, lick yeah. my lips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it, it's really dry. Yeah. Um, but it, you can do lots with it. So either what we're about to do, make a, a sort of a, a slow gin. It's more of a sort of slow gin liqueur. Um, because we're going to be adding in um, sugar, which uh, sort of affects the ABV. So what I've got um, is some uh, supermarket gin. So okay, so you're, it's fine just to, in one sense, pick any gin and yep. put it in there to make your slow gin, your homemade there slow gin. There is something gin. you have to do first, though. Okay. Don't tell me I have to eat all and those. And you, ha you have to prick every single one. Do you? Yeah, because you, you need to get the... Um, the prick it, like prick? Yeah, to release the flavour. So I just prick. Yeah. Like, is that good enough? Yeah, perfect. Okay. It doesn't need to be like sliced. No. Nope. Prick. Okay. Or there's a cheat. Okay. What's the cheat? You throw it into the freezer beforehand, and basically the um, the fact that it's super super cold in there will basically break down the the, um, the skins, so it will release I the flavour. So I've saved you a massive okay. task. Okay. Okay. <laughs> freezing it overnight, yeah. and then so so you can do this the quick way yeah. in one sense. Yeah. Well, it's popular here, especially for shooting, Yeah. right? And so you're out on your 11s yep. and everybody has slow gin. That was the, my first introduction. Was it? Most people <laughs> will sometimes start when you're drawing pegs uh, at the beginning of the morning, they'll give you a top glass um, with your slow gin in. Oh. You then have to drink it. And at the bottom of your top cup is your peg number. <laughs> so, oh. so you start quite early. <laughs> I haven't been to one of those shoots. Now I yeah, yeah. I'm going to cheat it. So I'm going to pop, pop <laughs> so you those in there. So yeah, early. you know, it's, um, there's uh, people who just enjoy it for what it is, but yes, it, it's pr it's, it is synonymous with shooting or field sports, or um, it's just one of those sort of things that people really enjoy. Yes. Most people say with slow gin, um, it's a third, a third, a third. Okay. So a third uh, fruit, um, a third sugar, and then a third your, your gin. Okay. Um, but I tend to sort of increase my, my fruit a little bit and reduce the amount of sugar that I put in initially. Because once you put the put the sugar in, and it's made, if you make it too sweet, it's 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 too syrupy. And it's, okay. So I, you can always add add the um, add more um, sugar to it at a, at a point in time. Okay. And are you tasting it while you're adding? That's it? a that's yes. a really important <laughs> aspect of making slow gin. You have to taste it at least once a week. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so don't look at the label. No, no, no. Just gin. It's just it's gin. Just it's in. just gin. It's do you want to do it? Okay, yeah, so I'm gonna um, pour it in. So just pour it in. Okay. Make sure, oh, there we go. Yep. Okay. So this is- and just keep going. And just keep, you, yeah. so I'm pouring the whole thing Yeah, in. yeah, we're gonna fill it all the way up to the top. <gasps> oh my goodness. Why don't you leave a bit of, bit of space um, for, for some sugar? Okay. Oh, wow. So this is gonna make quite a lot of slow gin, yes. or not really. Yeah, yes. yeah it will. Look, it's already turning the color, fantastic. So we're gonna get three in here, no. Yeah, I would possibly. Oh, how wonderful. And then how long does this need to stay in? So you, you have to sort of turn it um, uh, every a couple of days. So give it a bit of a sort of shake up because you want the sugar to um, to dissolve. Yeah. Um, and again, it just helps to sort of move everything around. Um, so I reckon probably three, three months and you're just adding the sugar. Fantastic. This is how you make your own slow gin. So it just means you have to come back. You have I know, to, I, I am. Try it. I've already invited myself. <laughs> I am coming back. I mean, it's, who wouldn't want to come back here? I mean, this is brilliant. I mean, it's just so magical here. How wonderful. Let me put a little bit more gin in and then we'll just give it a shake and then you've got to put it, put it into somewhere sort of dark, um, a dark sort of cupboard. So dark cupboard and then yeah. you check on it every... So give it a shake every, every um, couple of days. Um, and then taste it after six weeks. Yeah, just see how you're getting on. Whether you need to, ah. I forgot the cork, but. <gasps> Lovely. Oh, it's rather pretty. Fantastic. So then this just needs to go into a dark. Yeah, just, just, just settle, put a cork on it and then, um, and then that's that, done. Okay, great. Well, should we just sit and drink? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and watch, Cheers. and watch the, the slow. <laughs> Slowly happening. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Amazing, Mark. Thank you.
Pentilly Castle has undergone many changes since it was built for Sir James Tilly in the late 17th century. But one treasure that has kept ticking since then is up in the tower overlooking the croquet lawn. And I'm just in time to give Sammy a hand. The aptly named clock tower. We're going up to one o'clock, which happens every Friday. There's no, wait until I've got up here. <laughs> okay. You're much quicker than I am, I suspect, because you do this. How many times a week? Oh, it's about to go. Fantastic. Friday ready. It's on time. Just in time. Yes. This is obviously, I mean, this is quite ancient. Well, older than you and I. Yeah, exactly. Imagine. Exactly. It's got grey hairs than me. And so um, what, what does it date back to? This is 1788. And the bells, oop, I just dunked my head. The bells, so of which this one isn't the one that dongs, but we can just dong this one for. <laughs> that was a bit loud. <laughs> so that one's just if you need to ring a ding dong, ding dong. But the one on the top, they're both 1705. And there's a few more down in the cellar. So James City must have had like an array of bells, perhaps. Yes. The bell that's on the roof, which is the one that donged at 10, is. 1705. It's 1705. But the clock itself is 1788. Right. So this it must clock. have had to be repaired yeah, exactly. at some point. So, so you come up here how often? Once a week. Once a week? Friday mornings normally. Right. Not always me, I confess. It is sometimes Steve Gardner, who's a legend and comes and keeps us on time. Um, but basically what we've got here is two big, great big reels with wire on. Yes. And if you look up here, so they come out of here and then onto a pulley and each one goes down that long tube. Can you see down, yes, down, down? Yes, I can. And they've each got a big weight on the ah, bottom of it. They do. So to wind it up, we get a week's worth of wind if we... Are you ready? Yeah. You can do this, actually. Slot it onto there mm -hmm. and then wind it. And I can never remember which way you wind it, not that way. This way. Yeah, oh, goodness. <laughs> Come on, Shira! <laughs> And then it will tell me when it's done. We'll look up there. We'll see the weight come up to the pulley. You just don't want to. You do this every. Sammy, there's a reason why I have bigger shoulders than you. Okay, now I'm getting. Now I'm getting my groove. <laughs> oh my goodness. So if it goes further, then it gets all clunked up and it's a, and then it's a problem. But this is the hefty weight. I don't actually know how heavy that is. And then there's the other one down the bottom still that we need to, to do. And this is my key here from here. Hang on, you're nearly here. Oh, yeah, I'm much faster on this one. Done. Well done. Oh well my goodness. <laughs> Thank you. That was um, now catch your breath. Is quite it? invigorating, quite hefty, actually. So, so there we are. The clock is now wound for another week. So this, if you were down below, you can just pull that and dong the bell if you want to. Okay. Oh, I might have to. I might have to do that. Oh, you can do it here if you'd yeah. like to. You okay. Can sort of okay. Dong me down the stairs. I could, or dong, I could you dong, dong you down the stairs. I'll dong you down the stairs. <laughs> there we go. In the early 19th century. The landscape designer, Humphrey Repton, developed grand designs for large country houses and their estates, producing drawings and plans in what were known as red books. Ted has kindly agreed to show me the red book produced for Pentilly. In 1810, the family had a huge amount of money and they decided to uh, enlarge the house greatly. Wait, your family had a huge yes. amount of money in yeah. 1810. Okay. It's all gone now <laughs> and, and build three extra wings in the house. But one of the things they did was get a guy called Humphrey Repton, who was a very famous um, landscape um, designer, to come and advise. And he did five houses on the River Tamer, and one of which is Pentilly. 
And the way he operated was to produce a, a red book, um, which could be in this format, or they could be, it could be much smaller. But we're lucky we've got a big red book. Yes. And he recorded what was here in a mm. series of drawings. Okay, so this is says that it, so, was, it was done. So for, during his period, though, he was well known. I mean, he was yes. he was sought after. Yes. So he did, he did a total of two hundred and thirty houses. And the red books are a sort of collective pieces. They should stay with the house, but quite a lot of them were uh, sold have, have, or have gone from the house. Right. Except they're worth a, yes, a, a of course, of course. Of so he's come here. And this is what he saw. This was the layout of the house. In grey was what was already there of the okay. house. Um, this was the original tower, I think, on the, on the terrace. Sheep pasture going down towards the river. And these were the, the outbuildings, the stable court and a gar the gardens mm. at that stage were very much closer. But so he was hired for this. Yeah. But he, so he was, right. So only wealthy families could hire him yes. to produce uh, this, uh, re uh, this red, red book. book. Yep. Right. And the red book served the purpose for... Design drawings. Design really. drawings is yep. what it was. And okay. the owner, I, owner could either say, yes, let's do that, and use the red book as the, the blueprint, or they could say, you know, don't think we really want to do that. Right. It's just so, the same as you, you employ an architect or a landscape designer now. Exactly. But I love how he's just written here, this lawn to the east may be fed by sheep as that is to the west or if not deemed too large, for a rosary yeah. or flowers garden. He went into a lot of detail yes. about it. He did a, a, a couple of paintings. That one is as he saw the castle when he arrived. Got the river here, and, and he came up with, a, with an idea um, of oh that. Good. It's like a flap. You lift the flap out of the way, <laughs> and you get a much more imposing castle. You certainly and, and do. And you've got battlements on it or crenellations. Yep. And the, the parkland, these were, were fields and the mausoleum being up here. And he said the fields look just like fields. They don't look as if they're the park of a, of a big house. So get rid of the hedges, um, but leave the trees. And, and you can the see trees these and... trees in lines. And there's, some of these trees are still there. His idea was that a view that's just a view is, is, is boring. There's no um, space. There's no texture. Or, there's, the, the, there's no scale to it. Right. And so he says you, you need to plant trees. So, so you he can did. look at a view. And you planted trees in a, in a set way. So you had the darker trees closer to the house and the lighter further away. So when you looked in, it, it framed the house. Right. And when you looked out, it, the world opened up in front of you. <gasps> Because Wonderful. the house was designed to be impressive from the river. Absolutely. Because that was the main yeah. thoroughfare in, in 1810. This is how he saw it. Yep. And then how he wanted it to, to be seen. Yep. And it's very so similar to that this? now. <gasps> oh, yes. It's very imposing. Look at that. And, the... and when he presented his Red Book to your ancestors, when they saw this, is this what they had intended to uh, to do in the end? Um, no, they didn't follow Repton's advice. I think they'd inspired them, and they got a guy called William Wilkins, who had um, been involved in St Paul's Cathedral, to right to, to design a house. And look, you can see uh, again, uh, lots more trees, many, many more trees. Uh, and, it, and the house was a lot bigger. It had these three extra wings um, going out. Um, the front door was now where the drive is, mm. uh, and it was a, a nightmare. It had 18 bedrooms and one bathroom. Yeah, that's so, a nightmare. So, so <laughs> the mornings weren't good. You right. needed to be up first. Exactly. And, and no heating. So the, the plans oh. for the house. The black is already there. Yes. Or, or was there, and he said leave it. Um, but the grey, it was uh, what he suggested that should be built. Should be built. Um, Fantastic. And you've got Mrs. Cox's room there. I presume that was the scullery, um, larder, um, cook's ser pantry, ser servants' hall, a grand Brilliant. hall here. What a fantastic and you know wonderful reference. A yeah. real yeah. And it's treasure. Fun that it's it a stays treasure. With the house. Yeah, it stays with the house. Just without without the house, it has no, to my mind, no value at all. It's wonderful that you've kept it here, and I've been been able to look at it. Fantastic. Oh, thank you, Ted. Not at all. How special. 
If you can see right behind me, that is the moon. It's just made its appearance and it's just incredible. Full moon, in extraordinary color, and really just capping off the most fantastic day here at Pentilli. I'm getting ready for supper. I can't wait to spend the night in my room, but today's day out has been sensational. So really from just arriving here, you know, picking up the confetti, blowing it away, spending time with Sammy, that extraordinary sun salutation uh, to help me with my fear of cows and picking the slows, making some slow gin with Mark. I mean, so much in one day, spending time with Sammy's father, Ted, at the mausoleum, and of course, the um, wonderful military wall with Sarah and that lovely walk in the garden and being able to really experience what veterans are able to experience here as well. I can't, I, I couldn't even, even have imagined what today would have been like and it has just exceeded all of my expectations you know sammy and her family are just one of a kind and to be here at this really loving family environment and around such a supportive community and of course that just says it all right there so i'm off to dinner and then i'm gonna sleep really well tonight Next morning, Sammy and I are up at dawn for a chilly swim in the River Tamar. It's a wonderfully exhilarating ending to my visit. Okay, it's not it's not too it's not too bad. What do you think? Well it's better than it's, I was expecting. I, I feel that it is warmer than the air. I think you're but right it, actually. Yeah. It it is. I mean breathe, get oxygen in, so yeah. all of a sudden it's getting the oxygen in. Yeah, definitely. But, but this is spectacular, aren't and it lucky? feels, what's the word I'm looking for? What does it, it feels feel like? sort of silky, does it, the water this yeah. morning? It feels, yes, it is. Is it always Supportive? like No, not always. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it feels really thin and like it's not holding up. Other days it feels rather like this. You could right. swim for hours. You could, oh my, I could swim for hours if my legs and arms would allow me to do that. Should we go but, to Devon? Um, yes, please. Let's do it. But so the tide is is obviously high. Yeah, so, so it's flat water at the moment. So we've not got too much flow going either way. So we can go straight across to Devon. Right. So, all right. Um, Enough? Yes, yes. <laughs> I think I'm ready we for a hot coffee. bath. Yeah. And, and a coffee. coffee. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, this is I'm definitely wide awake. <laughs> Fun, huh? It was just amazing. Woo! Trusty sun doing its trusty thing. Okay. Amazing. This is extraordinary. I would be doing this every day. <laughs> I am I am definitely warming up right now, which is <laughs> yeah, really, the really nice. The, the coffee's helping, the sunshine. But I mean what a, I have to say, spectacular day out for me. Coming here was just a treat because it was just different because I really got to see you running the castle but doing it so extraordinarily well with the leaf blower but also <laughs> you know and managing you know the weddings and the shoots that you have coming up and the guests that you have staying and, yeah. and still keeping you know Pentilly working and in the family. Yeah well <laughs> <laughs> Tamu oh, agrees, so Tamu agrees. She does agree. She's very happy to be here with all my guests. No, it's, it's fun. And um, yeah, there are definitely good moments. I think I think also uh, some days I run it better than others, but I think that's the same for everybody. This is everybody, for, is, for all yeah, of us. Deep breath. But, yeah, right, deep try. breaths and... And get it back and in the river. And get back in the river. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> whenever grounding exactly. in the dog that's going to ruin my hair. It's my hair look nice. <laughs> 
<laughs> <Isn't it? laughs> um, yeah, the dog comes and shakes on me regularly just yeah. to keep you grounded back in the real world. That's right. Well, yeah. I'd be, I'd be yeah, very lucky, here. aren't we? Very yeah. spoiled. Well, you do an amazing job, Sammy. So you deserve to be spoiled. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> well, it's nice to share. <laughs>